Hi everyone, my name is Noah Bergen. I'm a junior biology Spanish double major, um, and I will be presenting about the comparative analysis of the functional activity of the sterile sensing domain in NPC1 and NPC1-like proteins. And I worked with Dr. Patuk on this project over last summer as well as this spring. So let's get started. So let's start with a brief introduction. Neiman pig type C1, or NPC1 for short, is a large multi-domain transmembrane protein essential for transporting cholesterol from late endosomes and lysosomes to the endoplasmic reticulum and other cellular compartments. Mutations in NPC1 causes the Neiman pig type C disease, which is a lysosomal storage disease characterized by accumulation of cholesterol within the cell, spe specifically in endosomes and lysosomes of all tissues. NPC1 is, a, is 1,278 amino acids long, and it's a transmembrane protein. That means that it connects from the inside of the cell to the outside of the cell. It has 13 transmembrane segments and three relatively large luminally oriented domains, the N-terminal domain, the middle luminal domain, and the C-terminal domain. The N-terminal domain binds cholesterol about 90 angstroms from the membrane, and it was suggested that the sterile sensing domain, which is... Um, transmembrane helices 3 through 7 can also bind and transport cholesterol. And as I said, the sterile sensing domain forms a pore made of the transmembrane helices 3 through 7. So there are five of them. Looking at figure 1, you can see where the N-terminal domain, middle luminal domain, and the C-terminal domain are labeled, as well as transmembrane helices 3 through 7, which form the sterile sensing domain. And also along the bottom, you can see those red dots those are the mutations in NPC1 associated with NPC1 or Neiman pick type C disease. Next, let's talk about the Neiman pick type C1 like protein or NPC1 like. It's a large multi domain protein essential for the uptake of cholesterol across the plasma membrane of the intestinal pterocyte located within the cellular membrane. It also plays a critical role in the absorption of intestinal cholesterol through vesicular endocytosis, which is a lot in depth telling the function, but just know that it interacts with cholesterol. Um, NPC1-like has a conser conserved sterile sensing domain and N-terminal domain with NPC1. It's a known paralog of NPC1. And NPC1 has not been studied as much as NPC1, but mutations are known to not have as serious of an effect on NPC1-like. So, in figure 2, we have a slightly different image than the previous slide, but it shows the same thing. It shows that N-terminal do N -terminal domain, middle luminal domain, and C-terminal domain, the sterile sensing domain is labeled. Um, and then in figure three, we have cholesterol. So if you look in the red box, that group is called the hydroxyl group. And then if you look in the blue box at the top right, it is the isooctyl group. And I point those out because those are going to be important in the next couple slides. Um, but overall, there's not a clear understanding of how or if cholesterol is transported through the sterile sensing domain of NPC1 and NPC1-like. Therefore, based on previous literature studied, um, we hypothesized that the sterile sensing domain in both NPC1 and NPC1-like transport cholesterol with the same orientation through similar processes because they are known paralogs and I've conserved sterile sensing domains and in, in terminal domains. So the purpose of the study and the hypotheses that we had throughout this experiment, the first one that we saw on the last slide, um, because NPC1 and NPC1-like are paralogs, we hypothesized that the sterile sensing domain of both NPC1 and NPC1-like transport cholesterol with the same orientation through similar processes. So comparing NPC1 and NPC1-like, but then the second um, hypothesis is because the mutation from glutamine to proline at residue number 775 in NPC1 causes disease, but the same mutation doesn't cause disease in NPC1-like, we hypothesize that there will be a larger change in structure in the mutant type of NPC1 compared to the change in structure and mutant type of NPC1-like. We analyzed these two hypotheses through two different types of analysis, evolutionary analysis to observe 
conserved residues and conserved structures because that means that more than likely it will be a conserved function. And then the second one is structural analysis. So we looked at differences in the wild type and mutant type as well as interactions between the sterile sensing domain and the cholesterol. So really briefly, um, the way that we did our evolutionary analysis was we got the amino acid sequence of NPC1. We found homologs using BLAST and then did a multiple sequence alignment. We cleaned some of the data to um, remove redundant sequences, um, sequences that weren't super accurate. Um, then we did an evolutionary model and built a phylogenetic tree using a 300 bootstrap value because it was good enough to get a, a really good tree. We could have done more bootstraps, um, but based on time at the time that we did it, we we kept it to 300 because it, it built a, a really good tree. Um, in figure four, you can see the multiple sequence alignment and the rows of color is a good thing. That means that it has conserved residues in one particular spot, if you will, all across the sequences of a clade. So here is the whole phylogenetic tree that was mentioned in the last step of the previous slide. As you can see, it's really big. I just wanted to show the, the whole tree, um, but you can see the little colors um, in each individual clade. We're going to look at those in the next slides. So here we have the first three out of the six total clades that I particularly labeled and analyzed. Um, the first one is an all NPC1 clade from insects. Um, the second one, B, is an NPC1 clade from chordates, which is important because that's the one that has the homo sapien or human um, NPC1 sequence. And then the third one in the slide, C, is an NPC1-like clade from mammals. So this one also has the NPC1-like sequence from humans or homo sapiens. So these two clays are important for the residue conservation that we'll look at in just one second. Next, we have the final three clades from the large phylogenetic tree. Um, D, the first one on the slide, is a super family from NPC1, so not NPC1 or NPC1-like. Um, some NPC1 and NPC1s are there, but not all of them are those. From fungi, E is a mixed NPC1, NPC1-like clade from flowering plants, which is actually pretty cool. And then the last clade is a mixed NPC1 and NPC1-like clade from insects. So next, using the clades that I mentioned were super important in the previous slides, um, we looked at residue and property conservation in the clades with NPC1 and NPC1-like um, homo sapiens sequence. So the two pictures in the middle um, are the identical. So if it had 100% identical, same amino acid conservation and the whole clade in a position, it's blue, um, which is important because having identical amino acids are even more important than having property sharing ones, right? Um, the ones on the left are also um, important to note. If you, if you notice, there's a lot of orange um, this is particularly the sterile sensing domain part of the protein shown here. Um, and since it's transmembrane helices in the sterile sensing domain, we expect a high hydrophobic conservation in order for it to live and be placed in the membrane and for it to function well there. Um, and then on the right, we have structure stabilizing conservation or structure stabilizing residue conservation. Um, and if we compare the top, which is NPC1, versus the bottom, which is NPC1-like, we see a lot more color on top. And this shows that NPC1 has more conserved residues and properties, reflecting the deleterious nature of mutations um, in NPC1 compared to NPC1-like. Next, let's move into structural analysis. So we first did this by pulling the PDB structure um, particularly the sterile sensing domain part from the whole PDB structure of MPC1. Um, we built some of the loops and added hydrogen atoms, and then we built the system. So we put, we had the sterile sensing domain, and then we added it into the membrane, and then we added the protein in the membrane into the solvent. Um, and you can see that underneath the, the second blue box in the middle of the left diagram.
from there, we did an energy minimization and a molecular dynamic simulation. Um, and then we had a trajectory file from there. Before we moved into the right diagram, we did something called RMSF, which we'll talk about in just a second. And then we, from the molecular dynamic simulation, we pulled the PDB from each frame. And then we specified a pseudobond type. Um, so either hydrogen bond, hydrophobic interaction, and a salt bridge. Um, and then if those particular residues were less than four atoms apart from each other, and in the molecular dynamic simulation, it happened more than 50% of the time, we counted it. Um, and then we did some more analysis, which I'll talk about in just a second. First, let's look at RMSF, or root mean square fluctuation. Um, this measures the average deviation of a particle, um, for example, a protein residue over time from a reference position. Overall, that means that it just shows flexibility of the particular residue. Um, in this figure, red means that there was an increase um, in NPC1-like, um, means that it's more flexible, and blue means that there was a decrease or that it's lex less flexible in NPC1-like. Overall, these dull color changes mean that it's overall really, really, really small change. Um, um, so there wasn't really a large change in flexibility um, between NPC1 and NPC1-like, meaning that it's overall pretty, pretty similar in flexibility. And then the black arrow is pointing at the site of the mutation. Um, and you can see that it doesn't change colors at all. So that means that in both NPC1 and NPC1-like that it has the same amount of flexibility, if you will. Next, in RMSF analysis, we compare the mutant type with the wild type of each NPC1 and NPC1-like. If you look at these, the blue means that there was a decrease showing less flexibility, more rigidity in the mutant type, and the red means that it's more flexible in the mutant type. So, overall, we see a fair amount of blue and a f mostly blue changes showing that both mutant types have more rigidity based on the decrease in RMSF from wild type to mutant type in each, NPC1 and NPC1-like. Next, we look at hydrogen bonds for structural analysis. Hydrogen bonds um, provide rigidity and stability within each protein structure. Um, so figure seven shows conserved hydro or excuse me hydrogen bonds between conserved residues, and there are two in NPC one when we account for conservation in between residue number seven thirty nine and seven forty three and seven twenty six and seven thirty. Then, um, <clears throat> if looking at figure eight, um, if the hydrogen bond is in both NPC one and NPC one like, we will see. Um, similar dots on the opposite side of the imaginary diagonal line present. So um, on the X and Y axis are both uniform residue numbers for the sterile sensing domain because although that it is conserved, they're in slightly different positions within the protein. So we made a uniform numbering for the residues. Um, and then NPC1-like are the red dots in the top left corner and then the NPC1 hydrogen bonds are the blue dots in the bottom right. Um, you can see that NPC1-like has more hydrogen bonds between conserved residues than NPC1, and that's really interesting because we would expect, since there is more conservation on NPC1, for there to be more conser conserved hydrogen bonds in NPC1. But from this, we can conclude that NPC1-like is more rigid due to the higher number of hydrogen bonds between conserved residues. So next, we are comparing the wild types and the mutant types of NPC1 and NPC1-like respectively. So the first figure in figure 9, the graph on top, um, the X and Y axis are both the residue numbers in NPC1. And then this looks very similar to the previous graph. So NPC1 like mutant type is in the bottom right and the wild type is in the top left um, and that imaginary diagonal line once again separates them and you can see that in the mutant type 
there are some some decreases. Um, some disappear. There are some that are even added or increased in size based on size of the bubble or adding or disappearing of the bubbles. Overall, there are 10 changes. Um, there are five increases and five decreases in hydrogen bonds um, comparing the mutant type in MPC1 to the wild type. And then uh, moving on to MPC1-like, there are actually 16 overall changes, um, nine decreasing and seven increasing. And you can see these mapped on the respective PDB structures below the graphs. So if it's red, that means that it's an increase in mutant type and the blue is a decrease in the mutant type. Um, so, since MPC1 has fewer changes in the mutant type compared to changes in the MPC1 light mutant type, meaning that MPC1 light will likely show a more significant change in rigidity. Next, let's look at salt bridges. So, the next couple diagrams are pretty much the same thing as the previous slides, except looking at a different type of pseudobond. Um, so, figure 10 shows um, the salt bridges, um, and there aren't many that can serve in NPC1, um, one, actually. And then if you look um, in figure 11, you can see that NPC1-like has many more compared to NPC1, and the size of the bubbles are bigger, meaning that it has a higher conservation frequency. Um, salt bridges can form between charged residues, and they lead to increased stability and rigidity, similar to hydrogen bonds. Um, since MPC1-like has more salt bridges, it is more rigid. So now comparing mutant types and wild types within MPC1 and MPC1-like respectively for salt bridges, we see that in Figure 12, looking at MPC1, that there are eight increases in salt bridges once we go to the mutant type mostly towards the bottom of the protein, showing that the exit for cholesterol is more, more than likely more rigid due to the higher number of salt bridges. Once we look at MPC1-like, um, we also see a higher number of increases with six increases in, in salt bridges, excuse me, and one decrease. Um, similar to MPC1, we see most of these at the exit for cholesterol in the sterile sensing domain, um, so the mutant type for both MPC1 and MPC1-like are more rigid due to those higher number of frequency of the salt bridges, and the location of these increased salt bridges make the exit of cholesterol more rigid, causing intracellular buildup of cholesterol. So now moving on to the last pseudobond that I analyzed, hydrophobic interactions. Um, as you can see in figure 14, a lot more conserved hydrogen bonds within, I mean, I'm sorry, hydrophobic interactions in NPC1. Um, but this makes sense once again, right? Because these hydrophobic interactions interact because they're a part of these hydrophobic conserved residues. And since it's in the trans, it's a transmembrane helix, um, aka it lives in a hydrophobic membrane, that there would be more of them. Um, but then looking at number at figure number 15, <clears throat> we see that MPC1-like seems to have even more than NPC1, um, <clears throat> which is really interesting to point out. Um, hydrophobic interactions are important for the folding of proteins and are important, once again, for the protein to exist in the phospholipid bilayer in the membrane. So Ness. Next, let's compare the mutant type and the wild types for both NPC1 and NPC1-like. In NPC1, as we can see in figure 16, there are mostly increases within that one particular alpha helix, with a total of 174 changes. There are 13 decreases and 161 increases, meaning that there are more hydrophobic interactions, or at least a higher frequency. And then comparing the npc one light mutant type and wild types in figure 17, we see a change in a total of 153 hydrophobic interactions with a decrease in 7 and 146 increase um, <clears throat> change. And overall, the increase in hydrophobic interactions um, lead to more folding within the mutant type protein um, because that is what hydrophobic interactions do. 
influence within these proteins. The next thing that we did, um, building off of the molecular dynamic simulation, we actually did um, an equilibrated NPC1, sterile sensing domain or NPC1-like within the membrane and solvent like we did in the MD, like I just said. And then we added cholesterol. And then we did something called a steered molecular dynamic simulation where we randomly placed it within the, the part of the protein that cholesterol binds to. And then we added outside force to kind of speed up the interaction and transfer of cholesterol within the pore that we think um, transports it. And we did this for two reasons. Um, one, to determine if the paths in MPC1 and MPC1-like would be similar if we place them in similar places. And two, to determine the likely orientation of cholesterol. And that is where the special orientation and the groups from cholesterol from the very beginning are important. So the hydroxyl group and the isooctyl group. And we'll be talking about the orientation of cholesterol based on those two. For each steer molecular dynamics trajectory file, we pulled something called average total force. And basically what we did was measure the force needed for each frame to keep that cholesterol being pulled down in the direction that we specified. So we have four graphs. Um, starting in the left and working clockwise, we've got NPC1 with a hydroxyl group of cholesterol going down, as you can see on the top. Moving to the right, we've got NPC1-like with cholesterol in the same orientation. Moving down to the bottom right, we've got NPC1-like with the ice, with the hydroxyl group up. Um, and then in the bottom left, the final one is NPC1 with that hydroxyl group up. So what we're looking for when we look at these graphs, um, the x-axis first is the time in 0 0.01 nanoseconds. Um, and then the y-axis is total force and piconewtons. And what we're looking for as we compare these um, from NPC1 with the cholesterol in the same orientation and NPC1-like, as well as the different orientations within the same protein is which graphs look similar and have similar peaks and similar residue numbers. So as you look, we can see that NPC1 um, and NPC1-like with a hydroxyl group up, aka the bottom two ones, while the amount of peak is different, they are in similar positions. That's what we're looking for. If you look at the top two, they don't really have those, those peaks or checkpoints as um, I have started calling them. Um, we, we don't really see that similarity. So we're starting to think that um, cholesterol with a hydroxyl group up makes more sense for a more reasonable transport. And these checkpoints, or the peaks, we think are places within the protein that double checks to make sure that cholesterol is within that pore that is specialized um, for that transport. So it doesn't move outside into the membrane, break up the protein, go sideways and get stuck, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So next, we pulled these trajectory or steer molecular dynamics files, and we compared the path that cholesterol took between NPC1 and NPC1-like. So we did this by pulling it through that trajectory file and pulling the PDB structures per each frame and calculating the distance between cholesterol and the surrounding sterile sensing domain residues. And if the distance was less than two angstroms, we determined that it was interacting with that particular residue. And that's what um, created the, these figures here. So NPC1 is on the left and NPC1-like is on the right, the sterile sensing domains of each. And the purple places are, are the pores that cholesterol was pulled through and interacted with. Um, <clears throat> overall, there are some very slight um, residue changes, particularly at the end. But that could just be due to the placement. Um, overall, the wild types show very similar paths for cholesterol transport within the sterile sensing domain, which is what we expected and wanted to see. Next, we compared the mutant types of each with the wild types of their respective proteins. So NPC1, wild type and mutant type, and then NPC1-like, wild type and mutant type. Um, the mutant type in NPC1 actually didn't show that much of a change. Um, unfortunately, NPC1-like did. So as you can see compared to the previous slide, there is a lot less orange in NPC1-like. Um, we are thinking that more analysis should be done based on this. Um, 
these files take a while to make and a while to run. Um, so we weren't able to do it a lot of times, but we here, just based on this one, we observed that the mutation in MPC1 like seems to have a greater effect on the path of cholesterol based on the change in residues interacting with cholesterol, based on the color changes that we see in these figures. The mutant type for MPC1, like I said, didn't really have that significant of a change, maybe one or two towards the bottom where cholesterol would exit. So that's the end of my results, and now we can pull the main conclusions from my project. The first one is the high conservation rates, the identical conservation and property conservation of the sterile sensing domain between NPC1 and NPC1-like show the importance of the sterile sensing domain for the function of the protein and transport of cholesterol. From the RMSF, we can see that NPC1 and NPC1-like are similar in flexibility due to the similar RMSF values per residue, and the mutant type in NPC1 and NPC1-like are both shown to be more rigid due to a lower RMSF value in that mutant type. The differences in cheetah bonds show different interactions within NPC1 and NPC1-like and the mutant types of each. NPC1 and NPC1-like wild types have different conserved pseudobonds, bonds showing that they may fold or have different rigidities and different residues. Wild types and mutant types differ, so usually there's an increase in all three pseudobonds, um, hydrophobic interactions, hydrogen bonds, and salt bridges, increasing folding and rigidity. Cholesterol grows through the sterile sensing domain with a hydroxyl group up because the similar peaks in the steer molecular dynamic trajectory files are shown with the hydroxyl group up, and the residues with the higher forces are more likely to be checkpoints to keep cholesterol within the sterile sensing domain. Um, for future research, um, this summer we are continuing the study of the structural characteristics of the MPC1 in terminal domain and its ability to bind cholesterol. And from there, we will apply virtual screening to find small molecules starting with FDA-approved drugs that can bind to the mutated protein to restore the wild-type phenotype in mutants. For my acknowledgments, I would like to thank Dr. P, my advisor, Dr. Patuk, um, the PC Summer Fellows Program for getting me started on this project, the biology department for providing information and the knowledge that I needed, and my peers, specifically Kobe Kerbin and Shelby Baker, for doing previous work in this project and providing support and help when I needed it. Um, thank you all so much, and have a good day.